the green zone, all sorts of names. The dilemma we have from members of all parties was that they want the Capitol to be open to the public. They want public access, but they don't want a repeat of 1-6. So what we recommended to them was to use advanced engineering and architect and embed fencing in and around the Capitol as strategic places not the type of fencing you see there now, but fencing that would come out of the ground. Guess what some of them said? Well, that's going to be expensive. We give the Pentagon $800 billion a year, and being a part of the Pentagon for 37 years, and about half of it they can't account for them, they're talking about protecting themselves, and they say that's going to be expensive. And again, you just got to have patience and repeat it to them and make sure in the big budget they understand. So this whole package we recommended would come to about $2 billion, back of the envelope figures. And they're working on that now in terms of a supplemental. We briefed uh, about 15 uh, committees on the Senate as well as the House side. Uh, the highest folks we briefed on the Senate side was Senator McConnell's office, Senator Kobachar, and uh, uh, the Senate out of Missouri Birch, and uh, the Senate Armed Service Committee, and Senate uh, a Budget Committee, and on the House side, uh, beside the Speaker, I briefed the leader of the House and his staff, and about four committees on the House side on our findings. All of them collectively, we want the Capitol to be open because they remember coming there, many of them as youngsters, having picnics, going in and see the Congress a representative. Uh, at the same time, they want the Capitol secure. And that's the dilemma. We have a plan to do that. The initial plan, we have to harden the doors and windows on the Capitol. Most of them will not harden, as you saw on that day. And we have to fix intelligence and information. And we need those backup troops in Washington. Because once we put the backup troops in Washington, uh, there are a lot of threats. One thing we learned in my time in the military, if you harden this place, you harden the Capitol, they'll go find some place that's not protected. The prime target might be the Capitol, but they'll go to Supreme Court. Or they'll go to the Smithsonian. They could go any place in Washington and uh, do a similar thing because the idea of what of the objector of people who are doing terrorist activities is to exploit their political aims either by actions or through propaganda to, to make people think they're going to do something. And one of the things that uh, was in big discussion in Washington when I left and recently in hearings is that we don't have a domestic terrorism law. And I was talking to some people in Washington that said, because they asked me about it, what are we going to do about it? I don't know, we don't have a terrorism law. And uh, I asked one senior staff, they said, why don't you think we have a domestic terrorism law? We got a foreign terrorism law. Say, because our domestic terrorists vote. <laughs> There's somebody constituents. So I thought that was a little wisecrack, but you think about it, that could explain it. I'm going to spend a few minutes going over a few of the bills. The Green Army, Louisiana Environmental Action Network, for which Cassie Waskim's here, Mary Lee Over's here earlier, the Sierra Club. Uh, uh, and the Bucket Brigade, some of the uh, 501c3s, as well as many community organizations across the state. Uh, every year, we work with members of the Louisiana legislature to either 
uh, advance bills that protect our air, our land, and our water, or to block bills that are stupid. <laughs> I must report to you the stupid list is very long this year. <laughs> and some of them are repeaters. A gentleman told me who's wise in this that the legislature is very good at passing bad bills, and they're quick. Uh, and hopefully some of these bad bills won't see the light of day. I will be on Mr. Inks' show Friday. Friday, and we'll talk some of these in detail. So I'll be brief so we can have some dialogue and not to infringe on your time. Uh, I'm going to start off with the bills we want to stop. And I'll give you the number. If you want to know how you research with Kathy Waskin, can tell you how you go on your computer and you can find the bills. But because I'm, I'm just going to be brief, there's a SB 203 by Senator Bodie White, very powerful man. SB 203 basically is a bill to uh, exempt members of the Capital Area Groundwater Commission from following ethics rules. And it's retroactive. Not even the federal government is stupid enough to pass a retroactive bill. But we've done it before. It's a retroactive bill. Uh, in essence, uh, over the years, since 2012, when I got involved with the Capillary Groundwater Commission, uh, Kathy Waskin and I and Hayes Towns and others, we'd go to the meetings and uh, so then we had uh, Representative Marcel put a couple bills in one of them and a letter to have an audit done of the Capital Area Groundwater Commission. If you live in Baton Rouge area, you've been hearing the stories on and off for years about the life of the aquifer. That being said, the audit was done. That audit report is online. One of the reports in the audit was you have members sitting on the commission who are paid by the industry they work for, and their job on the commission is to re regulate the amount of water that the industry uses. Uh, in some parlors, I'm not a lawyer, but most people say that's a conflict of interest. <laughs> well, Mr. White's bill, uh, and oh, by the way, as a result of that finding, uh, instructions were that those uh, individuals was the we go before a judge for breaking the law. It's against the law in Louisiana to do that. Well, they went into litigation. They have not gone before a judge. That's why Mr. Bodie White uh, put two, SB 203 in, because it would exempt all future members of this board, and it would be retroactive. So he's overriding different branches of the government here to take care of these industry representatives from Exxon, Intergy, uh, Georgia Pacific, and Baton Rouge Water, who are currently supposed to go before a judge for violating the law. And that's what Mr. Bodie White Bill, he's a powerful man. Uh, he sits on the budget committee, and nobody want to make Bodie mad. So his bill got out of committee, they probably get out of the Senate floor, and then we'll wrestle with them on the House side and up to the governor's office. Uh, we want to stop that bill. Mr. Lambert has a bill that would um, involve recycling of materials, uh, industrial materials. If it smell bad, it's probably bad. This bill smell bad. You can read about it in more details. But it's not a good bill. It's SB 97. Then we have SB 617 by McCormick. Get this, he wants to make Louisiana a fossil fuel sanctuary, exempt from all federal law. The last time we had bills like this floating around in the United States, it was called a civil war. That's when it started. I hope this bill dies quickly. It has no place because it forced in its language, not to follow federal law. I think most of the freshman law schoolers at Southern and LSU would tell you, you can't make a state law that violates federal law. What is that called? There's a word for that. 
I can't spell it, it's too big, but there's a word for that. You can't do that. But he had done it. He is the represent Oil City, Louisiana. That's where the man from, Oil City. You would expect the man from Oil City want to make fossil fuel, uh, forever fuel in Louisiana. We got two bills here, 615 by Freiburg and 582 by McFarland that has something to do with targeting electric cars. They, want, they don't like electric cars. They want to raise taxes, they want to get rid of exemptions, and they want to put excise taxes on electric cars. I don't know why Louisiana is so mad with electric cars. If you want to buy an electric car, you got to order it or go to Texas. Because some years ago, they passed a law where you couldn't buy one. Well, last time I heard GM, Ford, and everybody going to stop making uh, fossil fuel cars in what, the next two decades? But in Louisiana, you have to pay extra to have an electric car. So it looks like we're going, we're driving the bus looking through the rear view mirror. We want to go back to last century when times were good in the 1950s. That's, what, that's the time we want to go to back in Louisiana. HB 569, Chromium, he, there's a, a suit that uh, emitted over a couple of years ago, it's been around maybe a half dozen years, where the, uh, some of the parishes were able to negotiate a settlement with some of the oil companies that left abandoned wells inside the parishes, inside the levy system, ground controlled by the parishes. That money is being sent forth now by the company. This gentleman here, Chromium 569 HB, he don't want the parish to get the money. He want to turn the money over to the CPRA. Hello. What happened in the philosophy in this state that local government knows best? Local government taking a lot of heat over this suit to get the land in their parish cleaned up. But Mr. Cromier, he wants that money to go to CPRA and let the members of CPRA decide where that money go. What, what a great concept, huh? What a great concept. Again, they want to take us back to the 1955 when I think we're really good in Louisiana. HB 399 and 331, y'all know the coast is receding, right? from the loss of our wetlands. In Louisiana law, as the coast recedes, according to Louisiana law currently in 1889 land law, that land that is covered by water should revert to the state. Y'all got that? And it's set at the high water mark where a toothpick can float in the water. I mean, they were very, they had some good lawyers back there, write stuff like that. That land belonged to the state if it's covered by water. Well, with the introduction of the sediment and we growing land, the legislators on HB 399 and 331, all that land that has been lost over the last couple of decades, the owners want to retain it, whereas that land should revert back to the state. Now, the state has all, not always followed that rule, because if you go to White Lake, which has about 25 wells in it, under Governor Edwards, he relinquished White Lakes to the oil and gas companies, because he said it wasn't navigable. There are barges in White Lake. The entire Louisiana education system could be funded if the state of Louisiana controlled White Lake. Right now, it's controlled by oil and gas companies. And you can go find White Lake on your map. 25 oil wells. The state literally get penance off of them. Uh, that's what happened when 
the landmen and the big landowners get control of the state capital. And right now, these two bills would retain that land in private ownership. The sports people don't like this because then they go out and put post-it signs on it and the fishermen can't get into the water. You with me? They posted this private land. And some of it is land that we're gonna have what, done redevelopment on and build it back up and they put posters on. The first $30 million sent by CPRA down in uh, Iberia Parish restored some land belonging to Exxon and the Tabasco Company, $30 million. As soon as that restoration was done, they went out and put fencing and posted signs on it. So we took your money, restored the land, and they put it posted. So hunters and fishermen can't go into it. That is the war we're having on the coast between our sportsman's paradise, people on the land, and what should be in the providence of the state. I'm gonna to go to a few of them we support. Uh, SB 129 by Mills, good bill with drinking water management. HB 88 by uh, Marcel is designed to control the amount of water taken out of the aquifer here in the Baton Rouge and Five Parish area, the Southern Hill Aquifer. That bill hadn't been read yet, they're on the negotiation. SB uh, uh, 94 by Senator Peterson. It gives a 15 minute warning if you live on the fence line of a plant that they have to inform you that something happened in the plant. Right now they have an hour to tell you if you are, if you are affected. We had an event up here at Exxon a couple years ago. <coughs> the people saw the fire from their homes. So they started calling the, the TV channel. What's going on in Exxon? TV channel called the fire department. I said, what are you talking about? Exxon, they call us. Then they called the state police. The state police got informed at 47 minutes after the people called from their house, the neighbors. We had a big meeting on that, and everybody said, well, that's fine, because we busy in the first hour. Now, how would you want to live next to this thing with flames and fumes coming out of it but they busy. That's why you get paid all the big bucks, cuz. I mean, I was in the Army for 37 years, three months, and three days, operated all the way around the world. We handled some pretty dangerous stuff. And if something happened, somebody's shooting and somebody's talking. But they, they convince educated people that they need an hour before they tell the community something's wrong. Landry got a good little bill on notification for uh, <coughs> uh, if there's new plants coming to town. I'm going to stop right here because everything else you can you hear uh, some parts of it on on Friday. Is that fair enough? And uh, how much time we got for questions, sir? Six or seven minutes. Okay. You know, the police have a legacy tagline to serve and to protect. They have a difficult job. You know, at one or two o'clock in the morning, some of the calls they go to, we, we don't see about them. We also don't see all the good calls they make. But boy, we sure see the bad ones. And uh, I do think, we need some reform, and I think they were on the way with the 21st century police uh, business. And I think history will show, if somebody said, what is the worst tagline, you know, like you use a social media ever created? It was the one that was born last year, defund the police. It will go in record as one of the worst ever, because you got to explain it. And people try to rationalize it. 
But if the people oppose it, people stop listening when you use that tagline. And there have been many intellectuals try to describe it. Yeah, we know what you're trying to, we know what you want. You want to redistribute resources to make sure mental health and other uh, parts of the government can deal with people short of confrontation to de-escalate and do some retraining. But it's the worst tagline ever happened. And right now, we have a challenge. We can't hire the police we need in the Capitol now. Uh, because being a policeman now, all police departments are struggling to hire policemen. Uh, the other challenge we've got is uh, a lot of police department still got that question, did you ever smoke marijuana? You'd be surprised if the police department, you can't be a policeman if you admit you smoked marijuana. Now I imagine most of them have, but they just lie. But that's still a question on the form. Have you ever smoked marijuana? And I think they're going to have to get beyond that. Uh, and we're going to have to pay our police more. Many of our police are uh, surviving on overtime. It's, it's a tough job. I think we need to be uh, creative. A policeman should be able to walk in any gym in this city, put his bag down, take his uniform off, and use the gym. You believe in that, sir? They don't get enough time to do physical training. And they need to learn martial arts. We, we do that with our soldiers. They need to learn martial arts. And they need to learn a little bit from the London and Paris police on how to handle somebody with a knife. Uh, so I admire them. I got two nephews, just retired last Friday from the Los Angeles Police Department. One had 40 years, the other one 38 years. And they served the community with pride. So we, we've got to protect them, but we've got to hold them accountable. And right now the camera has brought a lot of things to realization and the court's got to deal with it. But I think the bigger issue we've got that we're not talking about is the amount of violence we got on the street. We killed five people in Baton Rouge, what, the last week? That has about a 24-hour news cycle. Five people dead. People on people violence. That need to be addressed. It's not. Very few people talking about that. But it's on everybody's mind. That has to be dealt with. We can do better. I wrote a book, has a chapter on that. I'm not here pushing my book, but you can see it in Leadership in the New Normal. It has a chapter in Don't Get Stuck on Stupid, has a chapter uh, that deals with my recommendation on what ought to happen. But we're gonna have to deal with that because the number we kill in daily and weekly in our urban areas is just crazy. And that's not sticking in the news. What's sticking in the news, as he should, when he showed it on camera, some of the things that we have seen, and you know, the Floyd thing from last year. That's dominated the news. In some of those same cities, we got five, six people in a week getting killed. We're gonna have to get to that topic, and I hope the White House will take the lead on that. We need to start having a conversation on what we're going to do about gun control and uh, street drug control. How are we going to deal with the gangs on the street? Yes, sir. Uh, following up on that question, uh, the younger generation has a profound, you know, has a profound dislike for the police force. I mean, so I understand that some not so. How do you change that focus? How, what would you do? What would you suggest to change that mindset? How do you do that? Well, I'll give you an observation as a citizen. This is not necessarily, but I speak on leadership. I speak on cultural change a lot. Uh, children learn from their parents. We've got to watch what the hell we're saying at the dinner table. You with me? Children don't go up reading a book at school saying about the attitude about the police. 
And I'll just leave that at that. We got to watch what we're saying at the table. Because they're learning from us. Yes, sir. General, you said the uh, stupid list of legislation keeps growing. Yeah. Are we regressing? Are we making any progress at all? <clears throat> we are regressing faster than we are progressing. It's like, again, I was gone for 37 years. Louisiana was a lot different when I left here in 1971. But I love my state, and that's why I came back. I was well placed in Atlanta, home of 17 Fortune 500 companies, and I started to get involved in things there. I said, mm. besides, my wife wanted to come home, so that was another reason. <laughs> Is that uh, whatever energy I have uh, would be better spent working in a state that taught me how to read and took care of me when I got hit on the head with a ball bat when we were playing ball in the St. Alma churchyard and went to the charity hospital and they kept me alive. I owed this state something, so I come back. But I see much of the legislation is regressive. Fossil fuel sanctuary. Don't follow federal laws. We don't believe in electric cars. You want to know why your kid's leaving here? One of the greatest products we have is our youth. We educate them. Those of us can help them or they get their way out and then they leave. Uh, there was a caption someone said in the paper the other day. Oh, we're producing things and we're producing young, good, hardworking young people and they leave. You want to be in a state that don't believe in electric cars? That think fossil fuel has no impact on our environment? A place where many of the legislation said there's no such thing as uh, climate change. They're questioning the science when the entire world scientific body has given facts that there is such a thing as climate change and it's man-made. I think we've got to flip the switch. Uh, I don't talk about climate change when I go to Honorville or to Lafayette or New Iberia. I talk about pollution because I think what can drive us through reducing the impacted amount of toxins we put in the air that affect our climate is to find the solutions to pollution. I remember being in the Rotary Club down in Honorville and I knew not to use climate change. If you climate change in some of these places, they're so red and they've listened to so much uh, uh, Rush Limbaugh, bless his soul, that it's, it's, it's fighting words. So I did not use climate change. I said, how many of you have places you can't fish anymore? Boy, everybody hand, and you can see it. How many places you can't go hunting anymore? And you can see the anger coming up in their face. What are we going to do about it? We need to make them clean it up, John. <laughs> but you know what all those abandoned oil wells do? We got thousands of them in the state of Louisiana. They release methane and butane, and, and, and methane and, and benzene. And last month while I was in Washington, my last weekend there, I sat in my room and cried as a story came across the wire that a little girl in South Beauregard Parish named Kaylee, a junior in high school, honor student, was on near a oil well, 100 meters from a house, hiring a couple friends, taking pictures and hanging around like young kids do. And the abandoned oil well tank exploded, blowing her body apart, throwing it in the air 200 feet. We have put at least four bills in since I came back from the Army to deal with abandoned wells. This state, our capital, is dominated by the flag of the oil and gas company. I won't mention just one because they all have their flag on the top. They, they fight us every year in getting control of abandoned oil and gas wells. Here this thing is 100 meters from a house. 
It's a, a storage tank that come off of a feeder line. Louisiana allowed these companies not just to abandon the well, but they will put it in a status for future use. Some of these old wells been in future use for decades. It's a gift given to them by the Louisiana legislature, future use. And over time, they sell these to another LLC who goes bankrupt. Then another LLC with some of the same people in it will take it over. Then over a period of time, they'll give it back to the state, and the state calls it the orphan well. How can it be an orphan when we know who owned it? But the Louisiana legislature and their legal authority I call them orphan. We know who owned it. We knew who drilled it. The law says when you drill it, you got to do what they call P and L on it, plug it. But the legislation over time has regulated that, that they can sell it to somebody else, who sell it to somebody else, and eventually they end up back. The last data we had, the state of Louisiana, the year before COVID, because they stopped counting everything last year. God knows what kind of mess we could we stopped counting. We, get this, we closed 40 wells and we added 400. So God knows what happened last year. God, right now there's a bill by Senator Atlanta to take some of the COVID money that's coming to town for infrastructure or whatever. The governor and the legislature say he want to take 30 million to plug abandoned wells to put the people to work. And that is one way to do it, but we know who drilled those well. What was the, uh, I think, Exxon balance sheet was what, 54 million last quarter, billion? They can afford to mend those wells, but we gotta fix how we doing the wells. If the contractor fix it himself, they can fix most of these wells for six or $7,000. If we let DNR and Office of Conservation put a contract out, it's anywhere between ninety dollars and $150,000. And if it's somewhere in the zone, you have to pay somewhere around $200,000 to the Fish and Wildlife to the oyster fund. You're going to clean the well up and you got to pay money to the oyster fund. But some of these things just don't make sense. We got a lot of work to do. I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic. That's why I'm here talking to you, because we've got an opportunity to change. We got to hold people accountable, and we just got to push back on stupid. It's not good for it's not good for our health. It's not good for our kids. It's not good for our reputation as a state to be known around the world to have a a ruling coming out of the legislation that will make Louisiana a sanctuary state. That's going back, folks, to the 1860s. We, we got to stop this, and, and hopefully that will stop. Thank you for the opportunity.